Hi there, and welcome back to another episode of Let's Talk Real Estate Investing. I'm your host, Sharon Vornholt, and I'm so happy you're here today. My guest today is best-selling author Mike McCallowitz. I have been so excited about having Mike on the show because I'm a huge fan of his books, his philosophies, his philosophies around entrepreneurship and what he teaches in his books. Mike is the entrepreneur behind three multi-million dollar companies. He's the author of Profit First, Clockwork, The Pumpkin Plan, Fix This Next, and his newest book, Get Different, Marketing That Can't Be Ignored. He's also a former small business columnist for the Wall Street Journal, and he regularly travels the world as an entrepreneurial advocate. Welcome to the show, Mike. Sharon, thank you for having me. I am a marketing nerd at heart. So mm. Mm. when I couldn't have Great. been more excited about your new book, and I saw that it was coming out and I ordered it. And the thing that I especially love about what you do is your mission when you say, I'm here to eradicate entrepreneurial poverty. I love that statement. And I love that that's what your, what your, your goal is to do. That is a huge goal, by the way. Yeah. And I don't know if I'm going to check that one off in my lifetime, but I, I think it's an important mission. You know, what, what I define entrepreneurial poverty is, is the, the vision we have and the reality that happens. The vision is I'm going to start a business. I'm going to experience financial freedom. I don't have to worry about bills ever again and personal freedom. I can do what I want. That's the goal for so many entrepreneurs. The reality is we're working our tails off. We have no money. We're actually losing money. And that vision is, is really a nightmare now. That gap is entrepreneurial poverty. And, and it's something that we can't even talk about, right? You can't go to your clients and say, I have no money. I'm desperate and I'm working my ass off. Do you want to be a client of mine? <laughs> Forget it. So, so it's, it's a hidden, desperate secret. And uh, I've lived that. Uh, I've, I've resolved that for myself. Uh, I think hopefully permanently. And my commitment is to resolve that for every entrepreneur I can touch. I love that because you nailed it. Entrepreneurs, they work so hard and yes. they strive, they strive to make money. And one thing I loved about one thing that was always a missing gap for me and your other book, Profit First, was what a what a radical idea. <laughs> Put the profit in first. Who would have right. who would have thought of that? <laughs> who would have thought? Yes, you know, there, there, there's a concept called Oxum's razor, uh, and the philosophy is the more simple the solution, the more effective or the more applicable it is. And I was noticing in profitability, something very interesting is there was a study that came out from U.S. Bank. They studied U.S. businesses, it subsequently expanded to an international study. They identified of the 30 million small businesses, and the SBA identifies a small business as a company that does $25 million in revenue or less. So that's, that's my company. Maybe it's yours. Perhaps it's a lot of our listeners. That of these small businesses, 83% are surviving check by check, have no sustainable profit. They don't know how to pay their bills next week unless they have sales. Mm -hmm. So it's this constant hand-to-mouth survival. And I'm like, this is so weird. We start a business for financial freedom, yet no one, almost no one is achieving that. How can that be? What's wrong with us? What's wrong with me? And I'm looking at the formula of profitability. I'm sitting here, I'm like, profit. And I'm like, oh my gosh, profit is the bottom line, the year end. The, the words we use say profit comes last. The formula tells us profit comes last. And it's human nature. When something comes last, it means it's insignificant. It doesn't matter. It can wait. And in my own practice, I noticed I wasn't worrying about profit really until the end of the year when my accountant said, sorry, no profit or worse, They'd say, oh, you have $10,000 of profit. And I'd ask them where it is. And they'd snicker and say, oh, you already spent that money. <laughs> that was devastating. Um, I was like, we're not taking profit because we don't take it first. So profit first is about flipping the formula. And in practice, every time revenue comes in, we take cash, cold, hard cash, hide it from the business. We take that profit percentage first. And now we're assuring profitability for the business. And the business knows what's available truly to operate. It's a simple flip. But it's a profound effect on our behavior. It does. And it's a profound effect on the way you think about your business, the way you think That's about right. money, the way you think about all of it. Now, putting that in, I'd like to, to know what made you go down this entrepreneurial path to begin with? Was it your own personal experiences? Yeah, yeah. So uh, my quick background story is when I graduated from college, uh, I didn't get a job, not my dream job. I had to work at a local computer store just to make something. And uh, I didn't like it. And uh, I thought that maybe I could become an entrepreneur and make a lot of money. I, I read the 
the stories if you start a business, you become a millionaire, you know, because I, I bought into that. Look at look at the Elon Musks and the Sarah mm -hmm. Blakely's. I, I can do that too. Um, and then I started my own business and realized, oh my gosh, this is terrifying. I have no clue what I'm doing. And it was an instant hand-to-mouth survival. But I did fall in love with the possibility, not the experience. Um, I, I subsequently had built companies and, uh, and, and sold businesses, but I also had a, a massive failure where I lost and wiped myself out, had to restart. It was through these experiences that I, I, I believed the potential of entrepreneurship, but also understood I didn't understand really what made it work. So I devoted myself, it's really only about 15 years ago, I started, I did devote myself 15 years ago to investigate every element of entrepreneurship and what truly makes that component successful, the marketing or the cash management or the business operations. And um, figure it out for myself, simplify it, because I, I, I can't understand complex subjects. They really confuse me. I need to have it super simple, like yeah. profits not last, profits first. That's about my <laughs> level. So, uh, and once I codify that, once I understand it, uh, I like to share it. And so I was like, oh, this is, this is a natural for me to, to document this as, a, as an author. And that's when I became a full-time author. I still own businesses today mm -hmm. um, and still operate. I have two that I have direct equity in and uh, four more that I, 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 I'm a partner in. And uh, those also are guinea pigs for me in testing out all these different ideas that I'm investigating. That is so, such an opportunity though, that it, everybody else gets to learn from your test, your test businesses. So that's a, that's a great thing. One thing I love about your books is that they seem to be sequential. It seemed to be a prob uh, problem, solution, problem, solution. Yeah, yeah. Like we use that term in launches. Okay. You're, you're going to launch. So what's the problem? You get a solution, then you get your next problem. But as I look at the evolution of your books, at least the order in which I saw them, they're like, okay, you have this problem. So we'll, so let me show you how to fix that. Yeah. And then you get this problem. So is yeah. that, did you think about it that way? Yeah, but but not deliberately initially. Now it mm -hmm. is. How it came about was uh, after I wrote my first book, I started building a reader base. I mean, when I wrote my first book, no one knew about me. After I wrote my first book, a few people did, and I started asking them. I said, "You know, what's the problem you're facing now? What what did this solve? And where, where are you to your point? What did you solve? And where do you stand now?" Mm -hmm. And people said, "Well, I'm struggling growing organically. Like like I have to do a lot of things to push this along, but I want the word of mouth to spread and so forth." Mm -hmm. And so I wrote a book, The Pumpkin Plan, about that. And asked again, what problem do you have now? And I was like, well, yeah. we're growing, but we're not profitable. And, and these triggered all the subsequent books. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, though, I found that um, the most common problem that entrepreneurs have actually is knowing what their problem is. So the biggest problem entrepreneurs have is knowing what their biggest problem is. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a book about that, too. And that's becoming almost like a hub book. Like, if you don't know where to get started, not just in my books, and anywhere in, in, yeah. in solving an issue, um, I wrote a book called Fix This Next to identify what is the problem we're trying to solve in the first place. And then once we know it, let's find the resources that are out there that, that can solve that problem. Yeah, I think that's brilliant the way you've done that. And it's funny that oftentimes we start out down a path and we realize after we get down the path a little bit, oh, well, this is actually how I did this. And you, yeah. you must know subconsciously, but maybe consciously you're not thinking about that. Maybe. That, yeah, I think, I think the dots or stars come into alignment looking yeah. back. Um, but I'll tell you, they, they would never, if, if we didn't start down the path. So it, I think it's important to get started in the best direction we think we can go in. And that's why I tried. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, there, clarity happens as you move along to your point. Yeah. Yeah. And I've, I love something else you said in your book, and this is something that I've always believed I've been in three, um, male dominated fields. The one today is real estate investing and it's predominantly yeah. men. It's not bad or good. It just is. It is yeah. So I always had to try to be think of a way to be different, to stand yeah. out uh, rather than just the obvious, because I didn't fit into the, the model of the good old boys uh, club. So <laughs> I, I like what you say about different is better than better. And I've so believed that. And you talk about in your book about how to do that. So that was so brilliant. So what yeah. the dad framework, I think, I think you called it. Yeah, that's yeah, exactly what it was. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, I, I've been presenting on the subject now uh, with some regularity. And one thing I've been doing is asking audiences, entrepreneurs, uh, a, a question. And I say, are you honestly better than your competitors? And I frame it not in all regards, but in some regard, you care more, maybe you respond mm -hmm. faster. And the answer 
back from almost everyone is yes, in some capacity, I'm better. And, and I believe that to be unequivocally true, that we are better. Um, and then I ask, well, if you're better in the competition, don't you have a responsibility to be discovered? Because if your prospect doesn't even see you and they hire or engage someone else that's of lesser service, that's the problems. That's the problem of the client, but it's our fault for not being discovered. And that is the impetus that if we are better, marketing isn't a nice thing to do. It is a necessity. It is a responsibility. Mm -hmm. It is kindness. The DAD framework is a checklist and it's a simple acronym, but the DAD framework is a checklist for effective marketing. Mm -hmm. And the three elements are as follows. The first D stands for differentiate. If we don't break out of the common noise, we are invisible. A classic marketing example is a I received an email, I started off with the words, hey, friend. The very first one I got, I was like, oh my gosh, like, who's this friend who calls me friend? They don't even use my first name, God bless them. And I read it. And it was like smarmy marketing. And I'm like, oh, I deleted it. The second hey, friend I got, I never looked at. And every subsequent, subsequent one has gone to my spam folder. What we need to do is break out of that common noise. The consumer mind, all human minds, are very attuned to filtering out the irrelevant. So- if you do the best practice for your industry, if you market like everyone else, you are being filtered out. The brain has already been trained to ignore that. So first differentiate, do something that is inconsistent, unexpected with what the market experience is. Now, one caveat, I am not saying be inauthentic with who you are. I'm not saying be outrageous unless you're an outrageous person. I'm not saying be the real estate agent that wears the bows of the clown costume. Yes, it is different. You will get noticed, but it won't pass the second test. And the second test is attract. We need to speak to the audience in a way that's compelling and relatable. Do you solve a need they have? Uh, do you entertain or educate them in a way that they feel engaged? And this isn't, it doesn't have to be funny. It could be. It doesn't have to be weird. It could, it could just be super compelling or intriguing or serious. I remember watching a commercial for seatbelts about closing seatbelts, you know, cl click it or ticket or whatever the police say. Yeah. We hear these a million times, but how many times do you really pay attention to that message? Well, there was this one commercial that broke out I thought was excellent marketing. It was a video of a, a young family, husband, wife, and uh, young daughter. And in this scene, it's also slow motion. The husband is, is watching, engaged in something, presumably on a television, but you can't see the television. And you see him just smiling. He loves it. And the wife and the daughter are standing right behind him, and they're both all smiling. And all of a sudden, the husband's face turns from this big smile to absolute concern and fear. And as he does it, you see the wife leap up in slow motion and she wraps her hands around his shoulder and his waistline, locking her fingers together. And his daughter does the same, wrapping her fingers around his waist and it looks like a seatbelt. Then you see this impact and all these shards of glass come out of nowhere and you see this guy in this impact. And the commercial ends by saying, seatbelts don't only save lives, they save families. Wow. And I was like, oh my God. Yeah, that is different. A, a compelling story that gets us engaged. It's attractive, not in a way that's like, oh, this is so much fun. It immerses us and it has a direct. That's the last D. In dad, we need to tell people what to do. It was very clear from that message. They had one thing to do, put the seatbelt on. And we need to do that in our marketing too. In any form we do, it needs to be noticeable. It needs to be attractive, speak to the audience, keep them engaged. And then it must tell them what to do and that action needs to be reasonable and safe. They don't say like, you know, spend $50,000 on a brand new mm -hmm. uh, safety upgrade for your vehicle. That's mm -hmm. outrageous. It's too big. And it doesn't say, hey, you should just be safe. That's too obtuse. And it, mm -hmm. it tells us simply click that seatbelt. It's safe. It's reasonable. And it's a direction to take. So that's the dad model. That's such a good example. And I know in your book, uh, one thing that jumped out at me, you were talking about it can be small differentiators. And the one that I remember is you were talking about a real estate sign. And the, uh, oh, yeah. the, the investor yeah. or the agent, they put the standard sign in the in the yard. It's always the same. And then oh, there was actually- balloons, uh, maybe. Yeah. yeah. And uh, up on the corner, and then you had the analogy of putting the tall sign. The, and I think there's a company out there that actually does that today. But the sign is so distinctive. It's still just the sign. It yeah. still serves the same function but it gets noticed because it's different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. different doesn't have to be this massive shift. It just has to be something that gets people to say, what was that? If you can get a double head spin, <laughs> you've won the different game. 
how that, that one particular experiment came about, uh, a friend of mine owns a real estate agency in uh, Colorado, in Denver. And he, I said, what? He goes, we can't use this. He goes, we can't be different. He goes, maybe it works for other businesses, but we're too big for this. And I'm like, oh, here we go. The no. little devil horns <laughs> kick out of me. I'm like, oh, Greg, I'm going to get you. I said, how do real estate agents market? And he said, with the sign, right? It's a sign with a balloon. Sometimes they put it on a post, but the customers become habituated to it. Meaning we've seen it before. We know what it is. And it wasn't relevant in the past. It's not relevant now. We ignore it. So we changed the sign from a traditional sign to a windmill, like a lawn windmill with a spinning right. big windmill. Top, and we put the sign on it and uh, almost like a pinwheel, but it was, it was a, a four post one. And instantly people took that double take. Like, what, what is that? And it mm -hmm. got the attention. They started to get higher engagement. They got more people inquiring about their services and they continued to do this just by doing that. Now, other agencies may do it. And at a certain point, it'll become habituated. If everyone does it, it's like the hey friend email. It gets watered out. But here's what's fascinating. Most people are terrified to do different because we're afraid of being ridiculed or laughed at or is embarrassing or it's just not how the industry does it. I can't do it, therefore. There is no rules. The only rule is to break the rules. So your competition will be afraid to do it. As long as they don't do it, keep milking that cow for all mm -hmm. she's worth. Only once it becomes the new standard, everyone's got windmills, then you try the next thing. That's how you do it. Yeah, that's, that's a great analogy. I noticed too, and uh, when you talk about attracting people and engagement, and I looked at that exercise in your book for myself. So I think for me, I've been, I've been around a long time. So I've become sort of an authority, a trusted source. Yeah. You know, I think you can pick out which ones are a fit for you. Mm -hmm. um, they, I think they become apparent if you know yourself and if you know who your, your ideal customer is and you keep diving deep. And I was in a, a challenge last week where I was really challenged to go, go one step deeper. You know, you think, you know, but no, go just a little bit deeper. Yeah. But that, that was so important, that exercise. I love that. So the key to being different and get, it can, people get confused is not about being different yourself. Mm -hmm. It's actually an amplification of who you are. Yeah. Yeah. And that inherently is different than the competition. It's being more expressive of those unique idiosyncrasies or qualities or experience mm -hmm. or authority. Yeah. And that's the key here. I actually have a sign behind me that says, be you always. Mm -hmm. That's the definition <laughs> of, of successful marketing. Uh, as Oscar Wilde who said, be yourself. Everyone else is already taken. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> I love that quote too. Um, and the key here is that if we amplify who we are, it becomes a differentiator in the market. So investigate yourselves. I had a, a client who was and is a bookkeeper. And uh, she said, I have a real challenge. She goes, um, if I can get someone on the phone, my final stage of marketing is introducing myself and they make a decision. She goes, but I'm so engrossed in their numbers and I don't have this bubbly personality. I'm losing customers left and right. I can't market uh, effectively and I can't be different. And the point was, be more of who you already are. I said, well, if you're that serious about numbers, let's dig in more. Let's dig in so much that we're Spock-like. And let's start the conversation with the customer saying, thank you for considering our services. But I need to tell you something first. I am so excited and get so immersed in the numbers that mm -hmm. people think I'm Spock. And <laughs> you won't hear any emotion of a flat affect because I'm so ingratiated with your numbers. Mm -hmm. So just be prepared. You're talking with Spock. And that triggered a whole shift. Now they hear this, this kind of murmuring and silence as she's going through the numbers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And people are like, what, what do you see? They were getting so <laughs> excited about it. Her conversion rate went up. I, I dare say it was like a five times conversion rate just by leading off by saying you're talking with Spock. Uh, that, that is so cool. And um, for me, I've always told people that you can't, you cannot be someone else over time. Yeah. Eventually, eventually you're going to get caught. So yeah. you may as well know, understand you're not going to be everyone's cup of tea, but for the people who you are their cup of tea, just be yourself and be the best version of you. That's my, that's kind of my philosophy. Yeah. And it's total happiness. You know, when, yeah. when the right person finds you and you're right for them, it's a joyful experience. The only experience people have with your business until they do business with you is your marketing. If your marketing is inconsistent, they're coming under the premonition or the expectation of someone different. And there's going to be disappointment some, in some way. I was on a zoom call. This is like a week ago, Sharon, I'm on a zoom call. And I remember before the call started, everyone had their screen or cameras off. So you see pictures of them. And I'm looking at this one woman. I'm like, gosh, she is really young to be on this call. I'm actually kind of surprised. 
Then she turned her camera on. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> you, you just aged 30 years. <laughs> she, she's an extraordinary talent. She's a wonderful person. She presents so well, but there's an incongruency. She marketed in a way, her favorite picture is from when she was in high school or whatever. And she mm-hmm. presents a new way. And there's a subconscious mistrust. It's like, oh, you're not putting the real you out there. Mm-hmm. We all got to put the real, our real selves out there. And then when people experience that, it's like, that's exactly what I expected. That's what you want people saying. Mm-hmm. I had that exact experience. And I honestly, <laughs> I, I was at, a, I was at a, a party before yeah. COVID. And it was like, oh my gosh, is that this person? And, and you just, you don't know what to say when that happens, quite frankly. Right, right. It's uncomfortable, right? Which is a form <laughs> of mis- It's a form of mistrust. But, yeah. but the, honesty, the honest thing is we see that in marketing all the time. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the experience that we're putting out there in marketing is setting an expectation. And then there's an inconsistency in the actual service or product. Mm -hmm. And then the customer's like, this is not what I expected. And that's a real problem. Yeah, that, that's, that is so, so true. In the direct part, you direct them what you want them to do. You said you use the um, example of the, the performer that's performing on the street and you just, he wants one thing, a tip. He doesn't want you to go to Instagram and post this and say three things. And I always go back to, I like art fairs. So when I'm going to the art fair and there'll be the table with the candles and it has 35, 40 kinds of candles, I just walk away. Now, if they had three choices or four choices or one super candle, then I would, you know what to pick. So you have to be very careful in your marketing. Don't offer people too many choices. Tell them exactly what you want them to do. And that was something that, Sadly, I didn't know for a long time. I was not good at the call to yeah. action. Yeah, you're, you're talking about the paradox of choice, right? So the more yeah. choice we have, it sounds like there's more freedom, but it's actually more overwhelm. And yeah. then the number one choice is to leave. When it comes to marketing, once you garner someone's attention by being different, once you're attractive, meaning you're speaking to their interest, we have a responsibility to direct them, tell them what to do. Don't be obtuse uh, and don't be unreasonable. Obtuse is where someone comes to your website and uh, the link says, learn more. The whole reason I went to the website was to learn more. And now you're telling me to learn more about learning learn more. more. It, right. Um, that's like going to a car lot saying you're looking for a new car. And I'm like, oh, look around this lot, any lot, every lot in the world, the entire county has lots. Good luck. Uh, help me a little bit. Now, <laughs> the other time is you see overwhelm where someone's like, you know, you go to websites like uh, click here for your, uh, your, your, consultation and put down your deposit or something, or you come to the car lot and I'm like, give me a hundred thousand dollar deposit. We'll find your dream car. Those are absurd, uncomfortable requests yeah. and we'll walk away. What yeah. we need to do is be specific and reasonable. So you give them one choice uh, to do or not do, but make it safe. So the car lot, I may say, Hey, you're looking for your dream car. Would you be willing to give me your cell number? There's the ask in exchange. I will give you pictures of our inventory here and at our other lots. That's a reasonable transaction. And yeah. now we have a relationship that we can matriculate toward the ultimate transaction of you purchasing a car, me making a commission. On your site, in any of your marketing activities, this isn't just website centric, but anywhere, the ask has to be reasonable and safe, some form of exchange. Now, if your end product, like me, I'm an author, is a book, uh, which is a very low ask, it's $15 or something mm-hmm. like that. Sometimes you can go right to the final transaction. Welcome to my website, buy the book now. Um, in other cases, it's got to be multiple steps before we get to the more sophisticated transaction. Right. Well, you put out amazing content. So that would, people I know are familiar with you. So you, you've done a great job of differentiating yourself. Oh, thank you. Another thing that I, I loved in your book was do what won't scale. And I had an example of that recently where put something out on social media and said, I'm thinking about doing this workshop. You know, what do you think? Is it of interest to you? And then people were sending me back messages through Messenger and in Facebook. And I went on there and uh, did what I, we call unscalable conversations. I just I messaged them back and said, hey, Mike, I'm glad to see you're interested. What else are you interested in? Because I'm setting up some workshops. But people are reluctant to do what they can't scale, what they can't automate. And that yeah. was such a powerful lesson for me. The people loved it. It was some, it was a simple thing using the app on there, the voice thing as, you know, just getting back with them and thanking them. And it, I had amazing results. I love it because it, it, it's the essence of different, right? 
do what won't scale means do what others won't do to your yep. point, And therefore it becomes a differentiator. Um, I, as an author, what I noticed is my contemporaries, uh, if you sign for a list or whatever, uh, you just get an automated, automated drip campaign. So mm -hmm. internally it's like, well, I'm going to start sending videos like reader by reader. And it is a devotion of time. But when a reader gets a personal video from me saying, thank you so much for being a reader, it can blow yeah. their minds. And then yeah. they become my marketing engine. They talk about me to other people. So whatever can't be scaled is the opportunity. And I'll tell you, small businesses can jump on this way bigger, way easier than big business. Big yeah. business, there's so much bureaucracy and effort. They're like, no, just automate. Small business, we can be much more personable in, in a case like this. Well, that that is such a good point. And folks, I hope you really getting all this and go back and listen to this because these are million dollar tips that he's giving you. Well, I know you're on a time constraint, yeah. Mike. Um, you do have a final piece of advice that you have for people. Yeah. yeah just uh, the fact that I want you to have this awareness that the world is starving to discover you, the genuine you. And here's the, the technique to find out who that genuine you is in, in one day. Uh, it's doing two steps. I want you to email three or four friends from your past life, those, the blast in the past, maybe people you knew in school that you can contact and say, hey, I'm just trying to figure out what makes me as an individual unique. Do you mind sharing what made me different, what you remember about me? Do that same question to people that know you today. You're going to find a common thread. They'll say, oh, you were always so serious and engaging, or you cared so much, or you were funny. Mm. But whatever it is, that thread is your different. Now employ that in your marketing, and you're going to have a huge marketing win. Great advice. Well, thanks so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule and come on Thank the show. You. And folks, to learn more about Mike and his um, resources, his books, and his treasure chest of entrepreneurial tips, videos, he has a ton of great content. Visit his website, mikemichalowitz.com. And thanks to all the listeners that come out week after week. I really do appreciate it. And please leave us a rating and review on iTunes, and I will see you same time, same place next week. Bye for now.